Wow, so many people. Thank you very much for being here just after eating. I have a difficult thought. I must try to keep you awake, to make you, spend a, to make you have a good moment. And most of you will, will rather prefer to have a siesta right now. So let's try to do it together. Let's try to have a good moment. My name is Horacio González. As you can maybe hear, I am from Spain, but I have been living in France for more than 20 years. So, sorry, my English accent combines the worst aspects of both French and Spanish accents. I hope that doesn't bother you too much. I hope you will find the talk interesting. I work at Obiash. I am developer advocate or developer evangelist. The job consists in having discussions with developers, with DevOps, coming to conferences, collaborating with open source, and trying to adapt our products to you, our users. And I am also very involved in the local communities in France, from the organizing conferences, uh, meetups, and all that. Obiash. Do you know Obiash? So, please don't tell my boss I am not going to read all those boring numbers. <laughs> Let's do it fast. We are one of the biggest uh, hosting uh, cloud providers in the world. We have more than 3 million customers. We have 20 data centers. We have uh, hundreds of millions of physical servers, uh, hundreds of millions of virtual machines. Uh, and we are a very small company in reality, where the main office is in Roubaix, in the north of the France. So we are playing the same field that are all the GAFAM, but we have only 2,000 people, and we are a European company. And we have very different products. Well, so next time you have an application to deploy, in infra infrastructure to build, please, before going around to directly to OneGafa, take a look at our, our, to our offers. Maybe you will find it interesting and with a very, very good price. So, let's begin with a story, because it's just after eating. Maybe the story will keep you awake. It's going to be an interesting story because it's a true one. It's the story, it's the story of a mission. Yeah, we, at OBH we needed to do something. We built a team to do it. The team began to test different solutions. There were lots and lots of problems. We arrived to build something we were proud of, and then and then we have to maintain it against all kinds of problems. And the best part of the story, it isn't finished yet, because our solution is in production. So I am going to talk to you about all this story, and I hope at the end it can help you maybe to have new idea about monitoring, observability, and scale. So, as I told you, Everything began with a mission. Several years ago, that was the way where, how we monitored our infrastructure with something like through, it's a, a big dashboard with traffic lights. Red, there is a problem. Green, everything is good. Yeah, it's called monitoring. And we can, these kind of things were everywhere, and there was somebody looking at the screen every day, every night, in order to be sure that everything was green, and when something become, became red, hey, there is a problem in this application, who must uh, we call to, who must do? It was a classic monitoring pattern. Hey, does the system work? Well, I, at, the, at the time, 
We were already a big company with uh, more than 20 data centers around the world. This kind of solution couldn't really scale to our size. We needed not only to know if it works, but to know why and how does it work. It's a problem only for big companies. Yeah, until several years ago, it was mainly a problem for big companies or for companies with lots and lots of infrastructure. Today, it has become a problem for almost everybody because our dear microservices. Some years ago, everybody have some, had some monoliths in their infrastructure. Right now, those monoliths become lots and lots of apps, more apps, databases, but not only one instance. You need to replicate them, some slaves, some replication batches. Yeah, one service burst because, because we always need a boost. Ah, wait, well, a load balancer, a cache, a reverse proxy. Even, even for the smallest of applications, today we already have almost a, a big perimeter with tens of instances. So simply monitoring red-green, it isn't an alternative anymore. I really love this, this tweet from Brian Country, the idea of, hey, with microservices, every application becomes a distributed system with the same kind of problem of distributed systems. Yeah, <laughs> I like especially the part of an active shutter that it not only what can go wrong, <laughs> everything can go wrong. So, uh, sorry. So, what we wanted was to get insights, understand how does it works, why does it works, or why does it doesn't work, and trying to prevent several of the, of the most important problems. It was five years ago, we decided, OK, red green monitoring doesn't suit us anymore. Let's go to metrics-oriented monitoring or better observability. Let's try to add metrics to all our infrastructure, from the data center to the computers, to the application, from the electric consumption to the CPU using, to applicative metrics, network metrics, and let's try to use those metrics to understand the state of our systems at any moment. And that means having metrics for all of us, some three. 350,000 physical servers in 28 data centers, hundreds of millions of virtual machines, almost 20 terabytes of uh, network uh, of fiber between our data centers. We needed to monitor all that. And we needed to build one single metric platform, because if you want to really understand the state of an infrastructure, you cannot only have the metrics of a server. You also need to be able to combine all the metrics you have since the ele electric consumption of or the temperature at the data center at the rack to the applicative metrics of your application. So we wanted to create one single metrics infrastructure to get, a store, and analyze all our metrics. Basically, we also wanted it to be a managed solution because we wanted to be able to use for our internal needs, but also to propose the platform for our customers to allow them to create some added value services. At the time, we had already several solutions for monitoring or observability inside of Yash. There was, for example, an OpenTSDB. Do you know OpenTSDB? It's a, a time series solution that uses Hadoop. 
it's working. It works rather well. We use it for all our network metrics. We also have for ex had, for example, one team has, has developed a whole time series solution using MongoDB. It began like a pet project. At the time we learned about it, the team had 150 servers only for monitoring their perimeter. And they weren't able to scale it anymore. We had also Graphite, because Graphite was the legacy monitoring solution for many teams. And some teams had installed AnfluxDB in their side. AnfluxDB is, for time series, the equivalent of MySQL. It's easy to install, easy to use. It won't allow you to go too far, but it works for sample needs. So we needed to create a single platform to group all that kind of solution, and we weren't able to to impose it to our teams, because I don't know in your company, but at OVH, if you say to one team, hey, now you must drop your solution and use our company-wide product, the first reaction will be, no. <laughs> Why should I do that? Do you have a budget for that? How many days you can give me to do it? So. We needed to be able to persuade them that the solution was interesting for them and making the migration easy enough that they would want to do it. We couldn't force them to do it. The first question was, OK, we really love open source, and we don't want to create an at-home solution. So which one could be our base brick, our base building brick. The first idea was to use OpenTSDB because we already had all our network metrics then. It could have worked because on paper, it's a solution based on Hadoop as base. It should be able to scale for our needs. Yeah, not really, because I am not going to enter in a as based design problem, but the team at OpenTSDB has built all the solution around a data model that creates a key for each kind of metric. And this key has the associated values, all the data points, all the measure points. And this, the key creation pattern wasn't really very efficient. So it meant that if you had millions of series, you need to do some full scan of the hash base table in order to find, in order to do a sample select query. So it works very well for hundreds of thousands of different metrics. If you go in the millions, or especially in the tens of millions, it doesn't scale anymore. There are some other problems with OpenTSDB. It isn't the problem. We tried to scale it to do some sharding. And after some time, we said, OK, OpenTSDB worked great for one service. We cannot use it for all our needs. So that gave us our first strong constraint. We needed a solution to be massively scalable. We calculated that we were going to have, for all our in internal infrastructure, some 300 millions of different metrics. That was the scale. But being able to store, to scale, to store all those metrics what is, was only the tip of the iceberg. Why? Because storing, OK, it's relatively easy. You can always add more and more stores. You also need to be able to extract value from this data. That means we need to be able to combine very different data, a electric consummation of the server here, data center temperature, CPU use, 
and combine these metrics in almost real time in order to get some interesting results. And for that, we needed to be able to analyze at the same scale we were storing. That was our second constraint. We need a solution able to have rich query capabilities. We, will need, we needed something that allowed us to analyze the data directly in the time series database engine. The only open source solution that had the two qualities was a small one made for a, by a small company in Brittany, France, Warpten. It was open source, it was massively scalable because also based on Hadoop as base but without the designing problem of OpenTestDB, and it has a wall dedicated analytical engine inside the platform. So, we already had tested the solution to several hundred millions of different time series. The analytic capabilities suit us very well. The idea behind the analytics capability was to have a whole toolbox specifically made to deal with metrics, with time series, with hundreds of functions, frameworks, everything needed in order to make from sample queries to some machine learning algorithms directly on the database engine. And it did that by using a specific language, Warp Script, to manipulate this time series. Hey, why my clicker makes things like that? Sorry. It has another interesting property. It was able to scale in the big, in the left side, in, the, for in your right side of the screen, but also we could scale it in the left side of the screen because, okay, the main storage engine was as base, but you could also, could also use LevelDB as a storage backend, and you could, de could deploy it even in a humble Raspberry Pi. So, that gave us some idea about using a pipeline with, a sm with a small computers, getting some peripheral data, doing preliminary analytics, and sending back to the huge cluster directly aggregated data, it allowed a, great, a big flexibility. There are lots and lots of other interesting features. The other very, very important for us was the multi-tenant. It was natively multi-tenant with every customer data, has the metadata uh, encrypted in a separate namespace. So we began to work around Warten. It wasn't the perfect solution. It doesn't exist. So we had to add lots and lots of custom bricks, and our team had to learn a lot about Hadoop. Because saying, hey, your solution is scalable because, because it uses Hadoop and as base, is great if you have people able to do the ops part of a huge Hadoop, Hadoop and as base cluster. So we began to build our custom-made components and to get people be more and more proficient in Hadoop as base. We had, in several months, one year, we have the first version of our metric platform, and then and then another kind of different problem began. The kind of different problem was how we are going to persuade all our internal users to use our new toy. Hey, we cannot force them. So the question, the technical side of the question was, they already use OpenTSDB, they already use Graphite, 
and flux DB. We are going to tell them, hey, drop everything, all the work, all the monitoring script you have done in three years, and begin anew? Or it was our role to do the extra step and support their protocols? Who should do the effort? Well, we wanted the project to succeed. Though for us, it was clear that it was to us to do the effort. We needed to support the most used open source time series tools. And we needed to do it in a transparent way to make the migration easy and painless. Though, for the record, there was graphite. It was the historical solution. It was one of the first tool, tools that did monitoring besides using only red-green. With graphite, you, will, you was able to analyze the behavior of the application of the infrastructure in the minutes or in the hours bef before a problem. It was very used inside of ES, mainly for dashboards, and we needed to be able to support it. There was OpenTestDB. I have already told you about that. We have all our network, 20 tera terabytes, monitored in real time by OpenTestDB, and we couldn't ask the people doing it to change their monitoring systems. We had some Prometheus. Prometheus is very interesting because it has, from the querying part, the same philosophy that Wharton. It allows uh, rich query capabilities, but it is made to be run in single servers, not in cluster mode. You have several Prometheus servers from several parts of your infrastructure. We needed to have one central solution, but there were teams already using Prometheus, and Prometheus had a very rich ecosystem. So we tell, OK, let's add Prometheus to our list, and AnfluxDB, because it is the de facto solution for everybody beginning with time series. Right now, it's the MySQL of the time series, so we also need it. And of course, our native solution, Warp 10. So we worked from several months again in order to add all the brick needed to be able to collect and analyze data using all those solutions. We did that by adding external proxies to both the collecting and the querying endpoints. And those proxies translated from one protocol to the other. We did that. We introduced the solution to our teams. At first, they were skeptical. So you are telling me I only have to change the endpoint address and everything is going to work? Yeah. No, I don't believe you. It's a completely different stack. So we choose some pilot teams. We ask them to do a data collecting why. They began to send data to the legacy solution and to our solution. We ask them to do the same thing for the analytics part. At the beginning, we had some bugs <laughs> and so, so a small problems to tune. In a few weeks, we will, uh, they will able to be sure, oh, OK, it works, it's the same. Oh, and you are. You are telling me I can stop uh, doing the ops of 30 servers. OK, I go to the new solution. And we began to do that team by team. The first three, five, four, five teams were a bit more difficult to convince. When they tested, they, show, they showed it worked. And then it was the, the snowball effect. All the other teams, so if I use the new metric solution, I can drop my servers, I can drop the monitoring problem. Uh, it will be their responsibility and not mine anymore. They began to migrate. So after the first phase, 
one year after that, all the different teams and all the parts of the OBS infrastructure were monitored in metrics platform. As I told you, the secret in order to be able to do it was to support all the protocols. It worked very well for people who already use this kind of solution. There was another problem. People who didn't do monitoring yet. They didn't want to learn some fancy, complicated language. So we decided to profit from the moment and try to create another language in order to make from some sample needs to give some good analytics capability without the complexity of other solutions. And we began to work in, on TSL. T TSL is a rather simple analytics language, full open source, of course, and a proxy in order to translate it to Prometheus, Word 10, or AmpluDB languages. The idea was to do a language directly working with our users, getting their needs and saying how we can express their needs in a compact, easy to use form, form dot select, dot word, dot last, dot sample by, dot group. It doesn't do everything Warp Script and Warp 10 can do, but from the, for the 80% of the more usual needs, it's a good, it was a good solution. And our users simply love it. So we added it to a metrics platform. And then, OK, it works. People are in the platform. How do we deal with the special needs? And by special needs, I am talking about people who generated lots and lots of data. They wanted to be able to analyze almost in real time, but they didn't want to store it from, for one year or 10 years. Most of their data was transient, but they generated lots and lots of data. Well, we decided to create a multi-state infrastructure using some metrics instance in, with a memory disk, within memory storage. They could send us millions and millions of data points per second. We store it, we analyze it, it every second, every uh, 500 milliseconds, we generated aggregated data that was sent to our main platform, and we used the analytics results to generate alerts if needed. So we used that, for example, for the containers team. Lots and lots of containers were created every time. Most of them has a, had a short life. We didn't want to store that for years. We use this live solution to get the alerting and to aggregate data and only store the aggregated data. We also do it in a multi-stage way in order, for example, to get monitoring data of different data centers. We have data centers all around the world. We, we place in every data center a metric instance that got data and did directly some analytics in order to have a view of each data center. And then the first aggregate were sent to another metrics live instance with a second aggregate that gave a coordinated view of the infrastructure and only the relevant data, the customer metrics, the historical data of electric consumption, for example, were stored in the main cluster. That allowed us to go even, uh, even further that we could think. Be why? Because people who had this kind of needs didn't think it was possible. From then, with the solution before, it wasn't possible. So there were a lot of things they wanted to do that they never did. Now, with our solution, we told them, OK, you want to take metrics all the, every second. 
No problem, do it. Hey, you are generating millions of data points for every data center. No problem, do it. Do your analytics. Try to find something interesting. And don't worry about that, because you are only going to long-term store the relevant data. They also like the idea. And, and then we got a surprise. Yeah, we had the monitoring of all our infrastructure, but there were teams that asked us to use metrics for different things. For example, one team in one data center said, hey, your solution, I have, I have gone to Warten site, it talks about geotime data. They, there is position in, in every data point. So I want to make a heat map, a real heat map of our data center to have in real time temperature and temperature variation at every point of the data center. It was really good, and it, it shows that our, our data center, some racks could be moved in order to make head circulation even better. There was some, one of our customers, we proposed the solution in beta, and they began to use it for a very different use case from medical research. Why? Because it was uh, one, one person that worked with uh, analyzing uh, fetus monitoring data, the heart rate of the fetus. And he has been working for years in order to try to prevent uh, uh, fetus, fetal death, to try to prevent the death of the baby in the, in the uterus in the last month of the pregnancy. And that kind of data, hey, they weigh like metrics, like time series. And he began to use the analytics capability of Warten in order to do pattern matching algorithms and try to see a visual pattern that some gynecologist had found, try to find it automatically in, uh, in monitoring data. So they, they are working in a paper for a medical journal using OVH metrics, not for monitoring, but for research. Internal teams for, were also using the end for things like billing, like IoT, the temperature, even for things like a, a new a billing system for OBS, pay as you go, etc. So we were happy. Hey, our product works. All the company is using it. It's great. But there was a problem. The problem was that the team was six people. Six rather crazy people. It was enough to build it, but when it was built, we needed to keep it running. We needed to operate it. It isn't the same skill set. It isn't the same mindset. And now it was used in all the company. It has become critical in a few months. The problem was, in a few months, we had a, hey, that's a lot of zero, yeah. For 430,000 um, millions of data points every day, a normal day. We had more of that when there was problem in the infrastructure. We had, at that moment, almost 650 servers, most of them bare metal servers, dedicated servers, not virtual machines. Why we weren't using virtual machines or our own cloud? Because we were used to monitor our virtual machines and our cloud. So we couldn't use them to host our infrastructure because we were critical to monitoring them. So we needed to use only the most low-level uh, layers of our stack, physical computers, bare metal servers, and the network. There were the only internal services we were, we were allowed to use. 
So we had to install and maintain manually our Hadoop, our base, Flink from the alerting, warp 10, etc., etc. Right now, our big cluster in France is 200 data nodes, and we have uh, more than 60,000 60, regions on us base. We have millions of reads every second in the main clusters and millions of writes. So it's really a big infrastructure. And we have another problem. As I told you, we are rather small compared with Google or Amazon or Microsoft. And we are, have also a way smaller budget. So we needed to be able to use our servers near the capacity limit. Hey, if you have done a dupe, you know that the usual advice is, OK, you let almost 40% of capability empty in order to make easy rebalancing of the regions, in order to make the distributed systems work well, you give them some place. We are using our as base uh, 40, no, at 80 or 90 percent of the capability. We had a lot of error margin. If we had a problem and there was a rebalancing, it, it was going to create us a, some escalation almost every time. And if you have done a dupe, you know as mean that the, this little elephant asks for lots and lots of love. It's very, very powerful. It is also very, very needy. War 10 is also an interesting beast. There are lots of different subsystems. There are, there are the ingress in order to collect data. There is a Kafka. Why? Because you have a distributed system. Having a Kafka allows you to have some waiting place in, in order to be able to cope with eventual latencies. There is also the store. The store are the, the components of Word 10 that read and write on the as base with the region servers and data node. There is also a very odd piece, the directory. The directory it's the, the secret sauce that allows Word 10 to be so scalable. All the metrics are stored, all the metrics metadata is stored in real time in the directory with the row key in as base where you can find the data. So why are you able to query in Word 10 even with hundreds of millions of time series? Because you ask the directory to give you directly the row key in as base, and you never do a full scan of as base. But it's another, it's a difficult component because you need to have lots and lot of RAM, lots and lots of memory in order to be able to store hundreds of millions of series. That means almost a 500 terabytes, no, 500 gigabytes of memory in the directory servers. And another piece of, another piece, egress, in order to do the querying, it's where Warp script is executed. So, some other metrics about Hadoop, uh, big machines, lot of RAM, and I have ST. I am going to go further than I think, I thought. One of the biggest problems is that everything there is Java-based. So we had a lot of Java virtual machines running uh, with very high memory and several constraints. Things like a sample garbage collector was able to freeze everything for 30, 40 seconds, and if you freeze something there, well, you, have a, you had a risk of making as base think that the node was down and begin to rebalance data 
and then created new garbage collector freezes and then snowballing into a full crisis. So we needed to also use our platform in order to measure all the operating parameters of Hadoop, of Asbase, and of Warten in order to try to prevent incidents. Because we were only six people. If we wanted to sleep, if we didn't want to be always on call, we needed to be able to correct automatically as many incidents as, as we could. So we monitor the Java virtual machine metrics using Prometheus, for example, sending data to Warten. We also try to tune the garbage collector in order to prevent freezes. If you have done some garbage collector tuning in Java, you know that there are lots and lots of undocumented parameters. It's more of an art than a science. And especially when you go to see some Oracle guru, hey, I'm trying to optimize the garbage collector for a 500 gigoctet GVM, he told you, hey, you are crazy. Java isn't done for that. Yeah, but I have a need. Your problem, you are crazy. So we spent literally months testing the parameters. Hey, if I take this dash x6 and I put it a bit bigger, it's worse or better? Ah, it's better. OK, we are going to change another parameter. Ah, no, now it's worse. OK, we are rollbacking. And this was the manual tuning of the garbage collector in order to reduce the freezes. We also had all the proxies we had added in order to support all the protocols, mostly written in Go. We have some JavaScript part. And one of the things we had begun to do was to migrate a smash of the Go components to Rust. Because, yeah, Rust is rather hipster language, but it works, and it makes managing memory way easier that you can do with Go, for example. I have uh, still some... No, I am already... Ah, so, well, I wanted to tell you more things. We have put in open source most of the brick we have created, and thank you very, very much. Sorry to have in rush the end. <laughs> One quick last thing. If you want to know more about our solution, I am going to be there in the next uh, coffee break. Please come and ask me. I love to talk about what we have done. Thank you.